hear me better now? Okay. Um, up in preparation for my arrival to Botswana, I indulged in the flight food, drinks, and the seemingly en endless music and movie database, fully aware of my privileges and accessories. Upon arrival, I expected to be bombarded with examples of how excessive my life in America is, but this was not the case. The out-of-body experience that one anticipates when entering a new country didn't start right away for me. When I first arrived, I felt as though I were stepping onto the tarmac of an airport in western Texas. When I first arrived, I felt as though I were, oh, sorry. The air was thick and the sun was warm through our clothes. Any long distance sight was wavered by th the emitted heat from the vast expanses of blacktop. People around us in the airport were of many ethnicities and most wore clothing that was all too familiar. We walked maze-like through the airport and climbed into a seemingly normal white van greeted by our two friendly university hosts who spoke English fluently. We traveled on tar-paved roads brightly painted with road stripes. Every glance was met by shiny buildings of all sizes, cars minding their own businesses, while colorful street sides and billboards plastered the foreground. To me, I was not yet in Africa. I had grown up with sh such a sure-fire notion of Africa in my head. Movies and television shows accurately educate a young child's mind. Yet my surroundings challenged my childhood education. This notion of deserted landscapes, barely clothed, slender people with baskets on their heads, in the blazing sun was not all that made up Botswana. Haberoni, the city that welcomed our first week and ended our last week of travel, was a metropolis, and it was the middle of winter. It is the capital and largest city of Botswana. My first week in Africa, to my surprise, was spent in a city larger than I am accustomed to in my life in America. In a shopping mall, buying ice cream cones from vendors, eating at fast food restaurants, and sleeping in a college dorm room. Touring the large expanse of campus ground, oogling at the new, shiny, massive buildings, and listening to PowerPoint presentations in a classroom did not expand my cultural senses. It did, however, make plain to me the amplitude of westernization. American music and, and music videos played everywhere. When eating dinner with a host family, the children and host mother were watching MTV and game shows spoken in English on their televisions. Don't get me wrong, the first week didn't let me down. It just opened my eyes in a way I least expected. As a group, we were taught prior to our departure about the different regions of Botswana, and Hebroni was described as a large city. However, I did not expect it to feel so similar and compatible to some of my experiences in America. For me, the journey into Africa, the version that exists only in Disney flicks, didn't start until we left Hebroni and met our rough-cut safari guides. With them, we tented our way around the country, finally to witness Disney-like scenes. We slammed on our brakes for wandering cows obstructing the roads, passed by citizens talking on their cell phones while riding donkeys into town, were victims of slobbery, clothes-eating cows, stopped every hour for tea time, and were an audience to the inspirational landscapes and sights Botswana has to offer, all the while making lasting memories with friends. While we were in Haberone, we stayed at the University of Botswana, which is larger than Alfred, and it's beautiful. The buildings are really nice, and everyone there is also very nice. Um, when we left the door of the airport, there was a monkey, which I remember, and because I had the same experience as Autumn, I didn't really feel like I was in Africa. And then I saw the monkey, and it started to feel a little bit more like Africa. Um, we went on a homestay dinner while we were in Haberone, and we split into groups, so in my group it was Rochelle, Carissa, and Jeff, and we pulled up to the door, we pulled up to a one-story house made of clay, and a traditionally built African woman opened the door and greeted us while her son hid behind her knee. Um, his name was Poco, he was about five, and she had a maid cooking dinner in the kitchen, but she had a very middle-class house, um, nice furniture, she had a portrait of the current president, um, which almost every building we went into also had. And 
For dinner, we had traditional Botswana food. We had beef pop, which is made of corn. It's kind of like grits. It doesn't really have a taste. And mapani worms, which are a delicacy in Botswana. Um, they're pretty big, and they're harvested, I think, twice a year, she said, from mapani trees. And uh, I didn't have one because I heard Rochelle sitting next to me eating it, and all I could hear was crunch, crunch, crunch. <laughs> so <laughs> when I heard that, that no, I just couldn't do it, um, but I don't regret it. And Poco had about 40, um, and Jeff holds the record of us. He had four. Um, after dinner, we had sliced watermelon and talked more with our host. And when we left, Poco said something to his mother, and she told us that he said he was going to marry one of us, which was quite the change from barely talking when we first arrived. Um, the picture of the statues. The man in the middle is kind of the father of independent Botswana. And the, bo the picture right below that is the Debswana diamond mine. Um, they're the largest diamond mine in Botswana. And diamonds make up almost half of Botswana's economy. So it was pretty cool to see. And it's huge. That picture doesn't do it justice to how big it really is. our time in Botswana, we um, did a tour, which we s was from the, where this picture from the statue is from also. Um, but the picture on the left, on the top, it's just an aero aerial view of the city of um, Haberone. Um, and the pictures on the right um, are both from Old Naledi, um, which is the poorest part of Haberone. Um, it's basically, I guess you can say squatters, people that don't have jobs. Um, and their houses are made up mostly of scrap materials, of stuff that they find um, in the area. Uh, there's basically no street grid, there's no sanitation set up, there's no electricity. Um, and we went in a um, university van to visit this place. And we originally were just driving through um, the area. And I know for me, and talking to most of these people, the first thing we noticed was these large piles of just mounded dirt everywhere. And there's clothes hanging, like drying on like any surface that they could find, and kids playing. Um, but when we got to about the middle of the, of the area, um, it was suggested that we stop the van and get out and talk to some of the people. And I know my initial reaction and most of the people that were sitting around me was like really uncomfortable about that situation and nervous because of the stereotypes that we've heard and um, the warnings that we had got from like very valid warnings we got from the university. But we got out and it turned into one of the most amazing experiences of the trip, at least for me, because um, we stopped next to a group of men that were um, sitting around just hanging out and they were drinking um, this malt liquor that they had in cartons and um, we got out of the van and immediately like kids started running over and they started pointing at us and like whispering and it seemed rude at first then we realized that I mean we're probably the only like are the first white people that they've seen face to face and obviously that would bring some curiosity but we started waving to them and talking to them and they like giggled and loved it um, but we went over and talked to the men and most of them didn't speak English, and so we talked them through translation of Charity, who was from the university. Um, and we asked them some questions, but then they also started asking us some questions about what we were doing, and they asked us um, what we were going to do with the information that we learned, um, which is something that I guess I hadn't really thought about. So um, they definitely encouraged some extra thinking that was unthought um, of. But they talked a lot to us about the healthcare system that they have, the government has set up. Um, most of the people are there living on like government funding. So they get about 75 pula per month, which is about $10, I think we figured. Um, and the free healthcare clinics that they have set up require a five pula like deposit for any healthcare system to have any healthcare whatsoever. So for most of them, it's out of the question because if you're raising a family on 75 pula a month, it's kind of difficult. But it was a great experience talking to them. And I think we definitely learned a lot. And when we left, they all kind of asked us, like, hey, hey, wait, wait, are you going to leave us with nothing? So Jeff, our kind soul, went over to the convenience store that they had over there, um, a little shack, and he bought, bought a crate of the malt liquor that they had, and they loved it. But it was a great experience and definitely eye-opening, I would say. Should be a little better. 
After Haberoni, we traveled north to Maun, which is kind of uh, northwest of the country, just below the Okavango Delta. Um, I'm going to introduce our guides. Um, this is Rod. He was kind of the, the leader of the whole operation, and his partner, Clinton, who uh, we met at the beginning of the trip but wasn't able to be with us due to uh, surgery. Um, this is Neil, and in the center is Doctor. Um, we met Rod first in the airport. Um, he's kind of like an African crocodile Dundee, but with sandals. Um, they only ever wear sandals there. Uh, we gathered into two safari outfitted land cruisers and met Clinton, Rod's usual partner, who would not be with us. Um, upon arriving at our campground in Maun, we met with Neil Kendrick, the other guide, um, who we would, we would be staying with, and Dr. Our Camp Chef. Uh, Neil is the owner of the Okavango River Lodge, where we camped a few nights. Um, Neil's distinctive features were no shoes, ever, um, and a hat that kind of looks suspiciously like mine. Um, I don't know if it counts as idol worship to buy a hat that exactly matches the uh, guide you're staying with, but I just thought it looked cool. Um, the lodge is situated right on top of the Okavango River. Um, at night, through the ruckus at the bar, you could hear hippos bellow. The lodge was really a beautiful place, and uh, did I mention the internet? It was kind of a big deal. Um, after, you know, being in Haberoni and, you know, being a few days away from home, it was kind of nice to be able to email and get on Facebook at well. So. Um, when we first got to Maun, we actually went to the Predator Conservation Trust. Hello? Better? Okay. And, um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> This organization is studying the African wild dog, um, which is what I studied while I was there. And it was very exciting to go and actually meet somebody who's doing very pertinent research. Um, this organization is doing educational programs with children and adults. And they're going into schools and teaching them that they're actually not as bad as they seem. Um, they started an insurance program with the farmers who would normally kill those dogs on spot. Um, and we were lucky enough, although they are extremely endangered species, to see the wild dogs four days in a row while we were there. It was an amazing experience. Um, while we were in Maun, we also saw a soccer game, um, which is their national sport. Um, we actually saw the tail end of a championship game. And, I mean, if anybody's ever been to, like, a football, like a World Series game or something, that was, it was that energy there. I've never been around something so exciting. Um, well, we stayed at the Delta. We were able to actually venture away from our campsite and with our guides that we were staying with, and we were able to walk like right next to the wildlife. Um, we were right next to zebras, tons of birds. Um, that's how I got my dragonfly picture. He was flying around me and he eventually landed on that stick and I was able to get a good picture of him. Um, it's also the scenery that we were in. It was wet at some points. Um, and then how we traveled in the Delta was in a Makaro, which is the boat that you see. It's kind of like a canoe cut in half. Um, but the sticks, it was like really cool how like they pushed, what they had to do was they had to take the, the sticks and put it in front and then they would push it back. And that was the only way that you could travel through throughout the Delta. Um, and we were on a sunset cruise and we were watching the sunset, we were on the McCarls and we weren't exactly sure where we were going, but we were just, um, riding along and just enjoying everything. And then we're getting, I guess, to like the end point and there's elephants on the shore. This is my first time seeing elephants in the wild. It was incredible. Um, we got to see them eat off of the, the tree branches and interact with each other. It was, it was amazing. Um, also while we were there, the people that we were staying with um, they created baskets, like you can see up there, and um, one of the people's name was Tony, and I got the, he carved the Marcaro boat, which is right here. He carved that. 
um, it was really quite an uh, amazing experience being able to be with these people and see these amazing animals. Um, so, Remy Game Reserve is a game reserve. Um, when we <laughs> traveled to Remy initially, um, we were on a blacktop road, and there's really only one blacktop road in all of Botswana, and it's shaped like a C. Um, and I remember distinctly coming to the end um, where it literally just stopped in a straight line, um, and Neil, who was driving our um, vehicle had to get out and turn the four-wheel drive on on the wheels um, and we actually got a flat tire that the terrain was so bad off the blacktop road we had to stop and change the tire which were massive massive tires um, but when we got to Maremi it was very exciting because um, we were kind of finally in um, the stereotypical Africa um, and we set up camp um, in the reserve <coughs> and shortly after we got news from one of the guides in the park that we had um, there was wild dogs in the area so we went on a wild dog escapade there and we chased them all around they were hunting um, so we kind of had to follow them for a couple miles it was um, pretty amazing and if you've ever gone 40 miles an hour on a rough terrain it's, it's an interesting experience um, while we were on our way to the game reserve, we saw um, a number of different animals up close. We saw first um, elephants, like we saw in the Delta, but they were probably feet away from us, and they really don't care. They just mind their own business. Um, we also saw hornbills, um, which are the little birds up there. If you've ever seen the Lion King, Zazu is a hornbill. Um, we also saw impala, which are the little antelope-type species, and they usually hang out in pretty big groups. Um, and then they look at you like they're real scared, and then they go about their business. Um, we went over a number of shifty bridges. Um, you can see on the on the top there. Um, and then there were massive, I don't even know if you can call them puddles, but um, it was, <laughs> and um, actually the second vehicle that I was not in got stuck in one of them, and we had to pull them out using a, um, I think it was a fire hose. Um, that they hooked to the front and they basically gunned it and it was crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, we also saw lions and we were actually feet from the lions and um, they're considered probably one of the most dangerous but this guy really didn't care. He was sleeping and he looked at us and was like, all right, cool. Um, and there were a number of cubs there as well, uh, which was interesting. You want to go to the next one? Um, up here, this is a vervet monkey. Um, and we also saw baboons. Um, we came across several other groups of elephants um, eating. Um, oh yeah, there's baboons down here. Zebra up here. Um, and then a number of giraffes as well. Um, I remember distinctly when we were trying to find lions, because we had seen wild dogs, but we all wanted to see, you know, the great predators of Africa. But, um, and we had heard that they were in the area, and we heard that they had made a kill, so we were driving around looking for them. and. Um, <laughs> we were not supposed to go off the path. You're not supposed to go like into the into the woods, um, but there was nobody around. So, the uh, <laughs> the other vehicle that I was not in went into the woods while we stood guard, and while they were in the bush, um, another group of tourists came through, and we all took our binoculars and looked the other way. Um, and they were like, "What are you looking at?" And our guide goes, "Oh, nothing, really, nothing." Um, so it's it's a good time, um, you know. You break some rules, but you learn from it. Our next adventure landed us just outside of the city Hanzi at the Dake Car Game Farm. It is the only game farm owned by the Bushmen, or more preferably, the San people. The Aboriginal San people have had success have been successful in their hunter-gatherer lifestyle for over 20,000 years and only recently have been driven to adapt to other means of living. With the establishment of the Central Kalahari Game Reserve in 1961, the Botswana government has tried to relocate the San, labeling them unlawful occupiers. Dake Kar Game Farm is a community-based operation attempting to help preserve much of the cultural history that is being lost to the San people. During the, beautiful, during the morning hours of our first day at the game farm, we were greeted by a group of stunningly beautiful men and women talking in cliques, wearing layers of brightly colored Western-style clothing. 
At first, we quietly watched the women gather oryx nuts while carrying babies on their backs. Slowly, we gained confidence gathering alongside of them as the nut searching turned into a heated competition between, between us all. The men of the group slyly handed us smaller seeds, and one of the men who could speak English told us to put them on our tongues. We innocently listened to these instructions while the San men laughed at our naivete. Upon imbibition, the seed casings exploded in our mouths with the intention of dispersing its seed a long distance. The friendly, pr <laughs> the friendly prank acted as an icebreaker of sorts, dissipating uh, some of the awkwardness. We regrouped at their huts to find a few women sitting on a blanket, entertaining us with a homemade string instrument and vocal tones while others proceeded to prepare the nuts we had gathered by folding them into small piles of hot ash. At this point, we begin to realize that the, that the sun are slowly shedding their warm, bright clothes as the sun came out and began to warm the cool morning air. Their garb slowly transformed from bright sweaters and coats into the earth tones of animal skin skirts and loin cloths, colorful headscarves, beaded accessories, and bare skin. After the tasty snack, they separated us by gender. The males went off to gather items for a trap while the women showed us their melon dance. They sang, whooped, danced, and clapped in a circle, all the while throwing a melon with graceful technique to the person behind them. We joined, and they encouraged us to bust a move when we caught the melon. Of course, we were naturals, blending right in with the matrons with our disco, our scuba, and Egyptian moves. After sundown, we were invited to watch as they performed their ritual dance. For them, dance is about respecting and appreciating what they hunt. The, power, the powerful aspect to this generational dance is its gradual transformation from a source of entertainment to something of a healing ritual. Three men in animal skin loincloths, staffs, and beads danced heavily with their feet around a magnificent fire. They took turns pausing from their dance to massage the sickness out of specific women sitting around the fire. The whole experience was very moving and powerful. You couldn't help but appreciate the compassion that was flowing from the dancers to their subject. It was hard not to feel like intruders as we spent the day with the sun. It was clear that they did not live in the hut dwellings that they came in and out of. The clothing they slowly changed into was not what they would go home in. I couldn't help but feel as if they were being exposed, as if their most prized traditions were being put on display for our benefit. From another perspective, the show that they put on for us was one way that they could hold on to, practice, and pass on their traditions after being forced to relocate into the modern world. I feel very fortunate to have experienced something that may very well become lost in years to come. Um, after we were in Hansi, um, we went to Sodillo Hills, which is a very spiritual place to the San people. Um, it's considered a World Heritage Site. It's very, very, very old, um, and it's actually the highest point in Botswana. Um, there are four hills in Sodillo Hills, um, and they call them the male hill, the female hill, and the two children, or one children and the grandchild, um, depending on who you talk to. Um, but we did hike the male hill, and it's about 4,000 feet, a little bit over 4,000 feet um, high, and it's quite treacherous. It's almost completely um, just, s there is no slope. It's, it's straight up. Um, and that was fine, but when we had initially taken off, Neil, our guide, told us um, that he would not be coming with us. He said that he has been to the top of the male hill, but when he got to the top, um, that he didn't feel right. Something just didn't sit well with him, um, and that he's never done it since, and because he doesn't want to feel that way. Um, and we all thought he was being ridiculous, and so we went up, and it was fine. Um, <coughs> But um, the trouble came when um, Rania and I, who were sharing a tent, um, woke up about 4 o'clock in the morning, and the wind was incredible. I swear to you, if, if we were not staked to the ground, it would have blown us several hundred feet away. Um, and I had a horrible dream that there were scorpions in our tent, and Rania had a horrible dream, and we're sitting there like, oh, we shouldn't be here, we shouldn't be here. Um, and eventually we did fall back to sleep, but I'd never want to experience that again. It was very, very, very scary. Um, and thank goodness we were only there for one night. 
Um, in the um, female hill of the Sodilla Hills area, um, we went on afterwards. Um, there are all kinds of rock paintings um, from all over. And actually, this particular one, I don't know if you guys can see very well, but there's a penguin and a whale. Um, but Botswana is a landlocked country, so um, it gives you a little bit of um, what it may have been earlier on. Um. So when we got back from hiking Nail Hill, Neil, our guide, told us that he'd seen a cow, this cow, um, <laughs> running off with a white t-shirt, and he tried to chase it, but he couldn't catch her. And it was my t-shirt, um, but that was okay. It was something I can live without. Um, and then later, Caroline uh, saw this cow, the same cow again, um, running off with her towel. And she, like, all we hear is like her yelling at it, and we see her chasing it through the bush, and you know, drop my towel, give me back my towel. And then she comes back a minute later holding a sopping wet towel. So she did get it back. Um, and then later, the same cow was kind of, she was standing like behind those bushes and just kind of watching us, I think, probably waiting for, you know, another opportunity. But that was my experience. So don't. After Sedilla Hills, we went to Cho Chobe. Um, to get there was quite a journey. We were in the trucks for, what, 10? Hours. Hours. Just hours. Um, we got to the, the campsite, like, late at night. So our guides were, like, saying, oh, there's, there's zebras here and there's elephants here, but we're not slowing down because we have to hurry up and set up uh, camp. So we ended up setting camp as the sun was setting. Uh, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, but we got up extremely early in the morning uh, the next day and went on so many safaris. And we got to see a whole bunch of different animals. We found um, water buffalo. We saw elephants. At the, the famous picture of Chobe is actually elephants drinking from the Chobe River. Um, we got to see two young male giraffes. Like, they were walking across in front of us, and they were in a group. There was about four or five of them, and three of them went, and then these two just kind of, like, stood there. They were, like, eyeing each other, and for about a good five or six minutes, they sat there banging their necks against each other. It was pretty remarkable. Um, and the, uh, me, Dr. Emmons, Jeff, Rochelle, the, we were in um, Rod's vehicle, and we're on this path, and there's this male elephant just, like, standing in front of us, and Rod stops the vehicle, and this elephant is like, okay, I'm just going to walk right next to you. And I really think all of us held our breath as this elephant walked by us because he was literally inches away from this th from the jeep. Um, so yeah, that was that was quite an experience that I don't think we will ever forget. Um, I believe that's a hawk eagle, and he had caught a kill, and was eating it in the uh, top of the the branch. So we like sat underneath him for a little bit and got to watch him when he eventually flew off. It was pretty. It was, it was a really um, interesting experience to be able to see all of that and see wildlife and everything in Chob. From Toby and Kasani, we took a day trip to Zimbabwe and Victoria Falls. Um, our guides took us to the border where they handed us over to a driver who took us to downtown Vic Falls. Uh, we went right to the falls once in town, and um, they're pretty incredible. The local Zimbabweans call them the smoke that thunders, and it's a very appropriate name. The falls are about uh, 300 feet tall and 5,000 feet wide, and at times it's actually kind of hard to see the falls through the mist. You can kind of see in these pictures it's so cloudy, and up in that one in the corner you can see just the edge of the mist there. Um, 
close to the falls there's kind of a strange uh, microclimate um, when you're approaching the grounds pretty dry and for the most part brown but everything within reach of the mist is lush green dripping and tropical um, as soon as we're close to the falls it kind of transforms into the stereotypical jungle vines everywhere monkeys jumping around the trees um, it was very cool we all got absolutely drenched um, as we walked down the 5,000 feet um, after we finished exploring the falls and drying off, we ventured back into town for lunch and our activities. Um, we have all three different activities here. Um, a bunch of us, they went on um, a lion walk. They got to walk with a couple juvenile lions. Um, I believe Rochelle and Caroline did the elephant ride. Um, they spent a few hours. They each had like their own elephant. It sounded like a really nice experience. Um, I, on the other hand, was kind of feeling the money pinch by that time. Um, so I went with Alex, Josh, um, Jeff, and Dr. Emmons, and we all went to, we were just walking around, and we decided to go to the Victoria Falls Hotel. Um, and we got a nice tour of the hotel, and we stayed for high tea. Um, that was interesting because I never had had the tea and crumpets, stereotypical high tea before. And, um, well, it was very quiet there. And naturally, I felt very American because we were laughing and joking and all excited to be there. And everyone else was kind of staring at us. But it was a very interesting experience. Um, Victoria Falls Hotel has this marker, um, just to actually give you a little bit of reference to where we were um, within Africa. I was gonna fix that. <laughs> in town, in between our activities and when we were trying to get lunch, um, downtown Victoria Falls uh, is kind of a, a touristy area, but um, the locals kind of know it. Um, hyperinflation has made the Zimbabwean currency worthless and they use a US dollar now. Um, trade's very important in downtown Vic Falls. That's how a lot they get a lot of their things. Um, I had shirts, uh, many things, um, leather purses offered for my shoes. Um, everybody was interested in shoes. Um, we kind of split up um, and got lunch at different places. Uh, the group I was with sat down for some kudu burgers. Um, those were interesting very gamey but yeah. um, like Carissa was saying uh, when we sat down at the um, the hotel uh, Victoria Falls Hotel um, the hotel actually hosted Queen Elizabeth um, a few years ago when she was quite young um, it's kind of an interesting clash of culture there from going to um, camping and lions and elephants to a very ritzy nice well manicured lawn um, but the animals don't really know it. There are warthogs running around the lawn constantly digging up holes while people chased them around and tried to get them off. But, yeah. Who's next? After our um, safari experience out in the wild, we went back to Haberone um, and did some more community projects. We did some work with like community gardens and um, that type of stuff. But we also visited the SOS Children's Village. And the semester before we went, um, during our class, we actually chose a few organizations to raise some money for um, to bring donations. And this was one of the organizations that we chose. Um, so when we arrived in Haberone, we went, like, went on a group shopping spree and bought um, a bunch of outdoor toys. We bought balls, all different types of balls, and hula hoops, and books, and puzzles for all different ages, um, which was really fun. And we got to visit the village, and we brought our, um, all the stuff we bought with them. Um, the SOS Children's Village, it's a non-political, non-denominational welfare organization, and they actually have villages all over the world. Um, and there's two, I believe, particularly in Botswana. Um, and each village usually has about 10 to 15 houses, and it's unique in the fact that they try to create um, family homes for each, for all the children that come there. Um, each house has about um, six to 10 kids, and they try, they mix genders and ages. They try to create um, as close to family life as possible. Um, but when we got there, we were welcomed by the director, uh, and we were given a welcome, and we went inside first went to one of the buildings um, and got basically an overview of the organization and what they do. 
Um, and then we got a tour of the kindergarten that they have there. Um, in the lower picture, you can see that's from right inside the kindergarten. Um, the kindergarten is for children that are in the village, that live at the village, but also for community children. Um, and it's very colorful and warm. There's paintings all over the walls. There was, I, mean, I believe when we were walking in, there was a wall with like Mickey Mouse and <laughs> Disney characters, which was interesting. Um, but there was a, a room full of napping kids and then a room full of older kids that greeted us with a hello when we walked in. It was very cute. Um, and then we got a tour of one of the um, houses that they live in. Um, and we were greeted by one of the mothers. Each house has a mother and an aunt figure, um, which are just are women that work for the organization. But um, the mother is like allocated a specific amount of money each month that she is responsible for um, using to care for the children, whatever the children need. Um, and either the aunt or the mother is around at all times to care for the children. And most of them have actually their own families as well. Um, but after our tour, the houses are very like normal, <laughs> I guess, for like for something that you would expect to see here. They're pr very middle class, but there's a kitchen and a living room and um, bedrooms for all the kids. And it was very nice very sweet and the whole time that we were getting a tour we had like a little herd of kids walking with us they just wanted to hold our hands or get piggyback rides get attention any way they could um, as you can see here these are some of the kids that we played with um, and after our tours we went outside and brought got some of the toys out of the vans and just went out and played with them in the big yard that they have there and there was soccer games going on which they are phenomenal at by the way and um, there's hula hoops and we did like duck duck goose all those kinds of fun little games it was a lot of fun, and they loved it. <coughs> yeah, I want to first just quickly thank Heather for putting together just a tremendous trip and inviting me to be part of it and co-teaching the course and co-leading the trip. And it was get to, to get to meet these biology students, really, they're not as bad as you've heard. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, I probably wouldn't have gotten to know them otherwise. It was so much fun. They're a good group. Um, I just want first they they suggested I, re I read a poem that I wrote at the end of uh, the end of our our trip with the two tour guides uh, and with Doctor our, our cook I kind of wrote a poem to thank them for all they'd done for us because they just did a tremendous job um, when we were out uh, camping and so forth on safari so uh, it goes barefoot kneel and ever capped rod two peas clearly born of the very same pod they were witty and wise dashing and daring. They could do it all, even fix ball bearings. They chased wild game. They kept us in line. They got us where we needed to be on Botswana time. Now we mined thorny bush, thorny branches, and gather the paper after we we. Uh, we give bloody L to all scabangers and savor our cakeys with a spot of tea. Good old doctor master of fine cuisine, joined us for Victoria Falls and a climb up steep terrain. He had a friend or relative wherever we went. He put up our, or took down almost every tent. He woke us up in the morning with the fire's warm glow. He kept our tummies happy with his peerless cooking show. Our affection for you three is matched only by what we feel for warthogs. So we'll hope to cross paths once again, joined, of course, by wild dogs. Um, then I was going to also talk about the, what, at the same time as we were there, there was a national strike going on. This was a huge moment in the history of Botswana. And I um, just want to talk a moment about this strike. It was mainly a public sector strike. People who worked in the public sector in healthcare, teaching, government, civil service. And um, the, the, these public sector workers had been caught in a crunch because at the same time as the financial crisis had hit Botswana's capacity to export diamonds and therefore really constricted government revenues, this forced, kind of pushed the government to freeze wages. So their wages, public sector worker wages, had been frozen for three years at this point. At the same time, as the cost of living had skyrocketed, costs of fuel, transportation, food had gone up. Just in the year before we got there, prices had risen 50 to 75 percent for these different basic needs. So um, there was a lot of anger and frustration. And at the same time, there had been corruption scandals, which implicated about half of the top leaders in the country were involved in, in corruption scandals. And the Arab Spring had taken place, uh, which really inspired people. And a lot of the union leaders felt like, wow, 
they went out and they went into the street and they made their demands and they won. And so what we see in the national strike, which lasted about six weeks, the whole time we were there, the national strike was going on, what we saw was people often kind of using the symbols and the rhetoric of the Arab Spring. So it was really fascinating. Here you see a sign, Ian Kama, do not take us for granted. Ian Kama is the son of the great founder of the com country, Seretse Kama, and he is not nearly the, <laughs> the type of person, that, uh, respected leader that his father was. And they called him the dictator, compared him to Mubarak and Ben Ali of Tunisia. Um, uh, and anyway, they were out. So our, our last day in Habarone, I was trying to follow the strike the whole time we were there. Not easy when you're on safari to follow strikes. But um, we saw a big, one of the big rallies. We drove right past it. And so uh, instead of going to a museum, I jumped out and went to the rally. And it was really interesting. Here you see they were rallying up here. Uh, this, was, this place is a very famous, important spot symbolically. The huge tree there, it's a very famous tree in Habarone. And they, would, they, they named this square Liberation Square, Tahrir Square, uh, after the Arab Spring. But at any rate, there were about three or 4,000 people there, and I went up and asked if I could interview one of the leaders, and they took me over, and I waited until the, he was speaking at the time up on the platform. And he, everyone was very nice, um, and, and I got to interview him for about a half an hour after the talk. My idea was to write a, write a piece which never emerged but after I got back. But uh, anyway, that was the national strike going on while we were there. Yeah, you can go on to the next picture. <laughs> <laughs> we want to leave you a chance to ask questions and so I guess what I really want to say is that for the other faculty members in the audience, if you want to experience travel from a very different point of view, go with your students. It's fun. It's interesting, a little scary at times. <laughs> but I think Jeff gave me more heart attacks than the students did. <laughs> running into a <laughs> running into that mob of people I didn't think we were going to get him back. Uh, but I wouldn't have traded it for anything. So take the advantage. The university wants you to go do it. Okay, so do you have questions for us?